Let Me Die in His Footsteps had another very clever narrative tapestry between Sarah Crowley in the 30s and Annie Holleran in the 50s. Please share how you wove that particular narrative together on paper. It's very tricky. Well, you mentioned editor, first of all. I had a great editor on that book. Um, and as far as the, the process of it, it's just sort of a, a controlled chaos. Again, it's one of those things I've learned to just accept it for what it is. It's going to be chaotic and a mess. And I'll, I will hate the book for the first three fourths of the time. That's, that's just what it is. Um, and then, and then once it's on paper, you go back and it's very much a matter of structure. Um, if, if you're going to bother to have two stories, they each have to affect the other um, in, in some way, character, plot, both, hopefully. Um, and and it's, it's a puzzle. And, and, and having a great editor, you know, a second set of eyes and a great agent as well. Um, but yeah, that... Um, and, and I, I believe, I get asked a lot, do you, do you go back and forth and write it kind of in a linear way, or do you do all of one point of view and all of the other? And it was sort of a mixture. I kind of would go back and forth as I would feel the other story become relevant. I'd pop over there. Um, and I remember getting toward the end where I just wrote out one storyline, wrote out the other, and then went back and wove them together and... Um, so yeah, it, and I'm doing that now with a book and Lily, I'm curious, was there anything particularly rewarding or challenging about bringing Aunt Juna Crowley to life on the page? Juna was, um, she is an interesting character. Juna is, this is, so this is Kentucky, set in Kentucky and Juna's story is, is in the thirties primarily where folklore is um deeply rooted in in the community and in, 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 in the belief system of all these people and juna is very very smart and she's smart enough to get people to do what she wants uh with one of the examples i was thinking of is juna's father was afraid of, again, this is the 30s, definitely afraid of going blind because of what he was drinking, you know, moonshine. So every night he would sleep with a lantern lit so that if he ever woke, he would see light and would know he wasn't blind. So Juno, when she was around him, even though the sun was not shining in her face, she would act like the sun was, like she was fighting off the glare of the sun because then her father would be, well, I, the sun's not bright to me. And she, cause she knew what his fear was. And she knew that about everyone. And she took great control and was very manipulative. And as manipulative people are very, very smart people um, in, a, in a street smart sort of way. What about crafting her really devious twists and turns throughout the story? You know, th those are things by and large that just, come out of the, the setting, you know, and, and getting to know who your character is and why they are. I mean, you, you mentioned earlier getting in the head of the bad guy and that, that is probably the hardest part. And if, you know, we look at Juna as the bad guy, why are they doing what they're doing? Because the bad guy doesn't think they're bad. They, at the very least, they are justified. They may not think they're a great person, but they believe entirely justified in doing what they're doing. So it, you, once you find that, you, you, things begin to happen. Um, so, yeah, Ju Juno was, was I, don't, I don't remember her being particularly difficult to write because I... Certain characters are that way. Certain ones just come quicker than others. I don't mean to bring him up again, but he was such a, was Ray that way? Um, yeah, Ray was, was pretty easy as, 
again, it's been it's been a while since I've thought <laughs> deeply about Ray. But I and see in that instance, for example, Ray is a bad guy. He was easy. Arthur, the husband, was was harder for me to to figure out. Um, but that, that's not always the case. Other bad guys are very difficult to, to find a way. Of all your novels where there's an antagonist, have you ever gotten feedback by a fans from email about one that really scared them the most? Or maybe even you while you were writing? I, I can't say really one. I, I mean, probably my most recent book, it gives people most pause, um, Gone Too Long. That's probably been the one that, um, yeah, has has people has gotten under people's skin in, in that way. And gone too long, you tackled the ugly history of the Ku Klux Klan. What first intrigued you about their past to make you want to make them part of this mystery? So, with Gone Too Long, set in present day Georgia, um, that was the first book and the only so far that started with a couple of plot points. And like, I don't want to say what they are because, again, I give away too much. But they, all my other books largely started with place. Like the idea of a lavender farm in Kentucky. That was interesting. And then I look at the history of the place and then characters start to bubble up. The Gone Too Long was a couple of plot points. And it, for the first two thirds of that book, it was just a uh, fast paced. It, I, I wrote it very quickly. And it's a, it was the first book I had that was under a deadline. Um, so I was writing, I had to write that basically within a year, which I had not ever done. I, I wrote it very quickly. It was coming very quickly. And I had this, I knew there was suspense in it. I knew it was, the pages were turning very quickly, but I kind of had this, so what? feeling like I which I often have <laughs> for most of the time that I'm writing something and but and so it's a couple of plot points and then the idea I was spending a lot of time in Georgia at that time so one of my kids was in school up there and I learned about the history of Stone Mountain Georgia which is just outside of Atlanta and it's Stone Mountain is uh, very has a long history with the Klan the, the sort of second iteration of the Klan, which I think it was 1914, when it um, sprang back to life and then grew to its largest in the 1920s, happened at Stone Mountain when about a dozen men marched up Stone Mountain and went across. And, um, and so when I learned about that, and it's also a place where the Klan has gone on to try to to gather and meet and, and they're denying them permits most recently that I, I just got to thinking, what if there are still descendants living in Georgia, which there probably are. I don't know. I fictionalized all of them. And then the, as I got more into that storyline, it's, it, it became what it became. Um, it, it's, it's a book about the emboldening of white supremacy and a young woman whose family has historic ties to the Klan and, and how does she deal with that when she discovers an abandoned child on the family farm.